I'm going to be talking to Adam Dorr uh, of RethinkX about a fascinating subject that I really need to learn a lot more about, and that's humanoid robots. And he, Adam has just published a blog post called Living Like Kings, How Humanoid Ro Robots Will Democratize Luxury. So I had to talk to him. Adam, welcome to the interview. Hey, great. Thanks for having me back. Always enjoy our conversations. Now, your argument essentially is that by 2040, uh, humanoid robots will be able to do a wide variety of tasks. The costs will come down so that they're more universally accessible, and that just changes everything. Uh, so maybe just give us an overview of the argument. Well, the, the thinking is that the convergence of artificial intelligence embodied in humanoid robots specifically for the uh, straightforward reasons that the, the human world is already built for the human form and the human form is a demonstrably successful general purpose platform. The, the human form is really great at adapting and working in lots of different environments in lots of different ways. So we think humanoid robots are uh, going to be the standout success among robotics and the convergence of AI with humanoid robots really starts to fulfill what we've collectively in our imaginations been looking, been envisioning uh, in science fiction and other popular media for generations now. And when those robots become capable enough to start doing the sorts of tasks that only human beings have been able to do up until now, it's really a complete game changer. It is the disruption of labor. And that has profound implications for industry, for all of society, and in particular, with the new piece that I was focusing on, it has implications in the home, in a domestic and a community setting as well. Uh, well uh, just Since we do a lot of uh, energy news here, and um, there's an energy angle to this, and that is, that vi for that vision, the stellar world to, uh, to emerge, you need abundant energy and ubiquitous AI. Maybe you could address that. Well, that's absolutely certain. I mean, the the it is clean electricity that is the fundamental enabling factor for the explosion of artificial intelligence, not just capability, but the actual deployment of that capability. So now that the the technology behind AI and rapidly uh, evolving robotics technology as well on the hardware side, so the software and the hardware both, those those are now emerging as capabilities that are of practical impact, right? It's no longer theoretical, theoretical. But that means where the rubber meets the road is how do we power all of that? And it turns out that the artificial intelligence requires an enormous amount of electricity to run those gigantic data centers and, and supercomputing clusters. And if we're talking about a very large number of robots, when we're deploying them at the scale of millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, this is about approximately the scale of automobiles or smartphones, then we're talking about a lot of electricity to power those robots as well, not just to move them around physically, the kinetics of them, but also to power their brains on device. They're gonna take hefty computers inside the robots as well as up in the cloud, all of that takes an enormous amount of energy. One uh, the, a consistent theme in the work at RethinkX, uh, you and Tony Siba and your other colleagues, is that disruption occurs when new technology uh, basically is 10 times cheaper than the existing technology. And in this case, uh, you're talking about bringing labor costs down by a factor of 10, which then has all sorts of implications. Right. It's, it's very clear the pathway to near zero marginal cost labor through uh, humanoid robots. So right now, a human being in a country like Canada or the United States um, is at, at a minimum earning 15 US dollars per hour uh, in most uh, situations. And really, frankly, less than that starts to become inhumane from the perspective of our cultures. Okay, well, the question is, can a robot powered by clean electricity perform labor for a for a significantly lower cost than that, and there, thereby outcompete human beings? And the answer is clearly yes. If these devices, if these robots are approximately the cost of an automobile and they're operating for 10,000 or more hours, 
then the cost per hour falls down into single digit dollars per hour. That math is completely straightforward. And there is a pathway once the robots start contributing to their own manufacturing, and once the robots start contributing to the, to the production of energy, manufacturing and operations, the costs just spiral downward in, a, in an autocatalytic, a self-reinforcing feedback loop. And then we're on target to, to costs approaching really just pennies per hour. And at that point, it's not just about disrupting human labor, it's about exploding an entirely new space of possibilities when labor costs virtually nothing. Yeah, your uh, Rethink X has, has applied this model to all sorts of uh, technologies, uh, mobility with robot, you know, with robo taxis, food uh, with uh, fermentation and other uh, chemical uh, advances and so on. And you can see all of them working together to bring about the stellar world that you're envisioning here. Yeah, that's exactly right. The convergence of these disruptive technologies is perhaps the very most exciting, promising, uh, overarching story here, that we're headed for a world of super abundance. Because if you, again, if you think in m the most fundamental terms about economics, about the production of goods and services, they reduce to, ultimately, energy inputs and labor inputs. And if your energy inputs become low, low enough cost and they're clean, in other words, they don't have devastating side effects, environmental, social, and so on. And if your labor inputs are very, very uh, low cost and there's, there is not a small cap on the supply, uh, if you relax those two constraints, everything downstream of those inputs to production becomes more abundant and, and cheaper as well. And so that really is, you're laying these, the, the cornerstones of a stellar world with those two key pillars. And uh, that is enormously exciting. It factors into everything, transportation, food, as you mentioned, and a variety of other domains as well. Uh, we're going to be doing a series of interviews here where we'll be talking about some of the, uh, you know, what happens if things don't uh, turn out the way we think, uh, and what ha what kind of uh, um, guardrails do we need, uh, changes in policy, that sort of thing. Um, but it so the uh, takeaway here from my point of view, Adam, is that this is a possible future that the technology could enable if we do it right. And that is not a given. There are all sorts of things that can, many a slip betwixt cup and lip, as they say. And <laughs> maybe I'll just, uh, we'll end the, this interview with that and, and the importance of building new systems for these new technologies and new ways of doing things. That's exactly right. We have some crucial choices to make. This is a, we're at a crossroads for a human civilization. There's no question. This is a, a, a crucial moment in the history of, of our world. And we have to make sure we get things right, or at least more right than wrong. And the question is, how do we do that? Nobody has complete answers. Nobody's got a playbook for this yet. And that means we need to be guided by first principles, principles like uh, experiment now at small scale, figure out what does and doesn't work, learn quickly, and uh, deploy those learnings as widely as possible. Keep an open mind, learn from everyone everywhere who's trying new things out, and figure out what works and what doesn't, so that, as you say, we can get those guardrails in place and we don't you know, swerve off a smooth and stable path through this, this transformation. Uh, I thought of another question for this interview, and that is the uh, because it's a phrase that you use often, uh, and that is we're moving from scarcity, where there's lots of competition for resources and what have you, to an age of abundance, where everybody can have whatever they need. And maybe I'll, I'll, I'll get you to address how that might change human civilization. Well, up until now, long before human civilization existed, when we were animals and well into our pre-human ancestry, scarcity was the iron law of life. Everything came down to scarcity. And in our ancestral environment, food and energy were the same thing, calories, energy, they were the limiting factor. And up until this point in human history, even though we've had, we've taken quite extraordinary strides away from scarcity to sort of relative abundance, we look around us and uh, there is indeed 
extraordinary prosperity from a historical perspective, we're nevertheless still stuck in a system that is fundamentally governed by scarcity. There's not enough for every single person to have all of the things they want and need all of the time everywhere on the planet. And so that is why our current economy functions as it does, a market-based economy that distributes scarce uh, goods and services. That can change, and we've seen it change for certain goods and services, digital ones especially, where the old economics of per unit pricing and exchange don't make any sense anymore. And instead, you pay something closer to a subscription or an access fee, and then it's all you can eat like a buffet. That's what digital digitalization has done to a number of information products and services and communication products and services. And what we really see moving out of today into a stellar world uh, is the same kind of transformation to a world where goods and services of all kinds, not just digital ones, are super abundant in that same way. It means a new kind of economics and also new governance, policymaking, and other social choices as well.